Check one, two. Silence. The sound is working. Saucy Jack. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, Matt, I'd love to just start with you as a person in terms of what's your relationship with music? How did you get started in scoring? Um, just how did you get into this, the field? Well, um, I always say that, it, it, you know, when, to become an artist is, it all starts with the love of the art. And um, for me, it was my dad's record collection. He has just a huge record collection, has a beautiful Marantz 2270. And um, I grew up watching the, the Apple logo going around on there, watching the, you know, Beatles, uh, uh, everything from orchestral to pop music to um, all kinds of ethnic music. Like there was really no distinction in, in our house. It was there's good music or there's bad music, you know? And so I just fell in love with music, couldn't get enough. And uh, when I was nine, I started playing guitar. And uh, as soon as I started playing, I knew, like, I was hooked. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I started on guitar, picked up bass. Um, actually, it was like my dad uh, saw my enthusiasm for guitar and he picked up a bass and uh, started learning it and then he quit so I was like yoink <laughs> took that into the collection my brother uh, got into drums and he he started playing and, and he, then he quit I was like yoink <laughs> so I ended up you know by the time I was out of high school I had uh, quite a, a good arsenal of, of stuff um, in the basement and uh, actually the the director of Apollo 11 uh, he and I uh, have known each other since then, and he was the singer in my rock band in in high school. So that's that's how long we've been collaborating um, creatively on things. So when we got out of high school, um, he went to film school, and I went to Denison University. And um, first day I was on campus, I uh, got together with a couple of my friends, and we started jamming in a in a dorm room. And um, and then like our future bassist and our future drummer walked by, saw it, went and grabbed their instruments. So we had like five people right. playing and uh, eventually campus security shut us down because um, you're not allowed to have electrified instruments in the <laughs> dorms. But uh, that band actually stayed together for nine years. So we we stayed in college and, and graduated and then just gave it a whirl. So I, I graduated college in 99. And we uh, went on the road and played in New York here and um, really tried to give it our all, but we kind of ran into that, uh, that digital piracy thing that mm. kind of crippled the, uh, the music industry. And so basically what happened was like, um, you know, they still wanted to sign you to a major deal and they still wanted to, you know, have all the rights to all your stuff and all your revenue streams, but the signing bonuses and, and the advances on those contracts were, were going down mm -hmm. because they had no answer for where all their profits were going. And they, they, they hadn't kind of invented that new paradigm of how to make money after now a recording, as soon as it's out, it's pirated and it's out there and you can't really make money on it anymore. So um, around that time I had started to do some of my first um, composing gigs for um, local retailers. So I'm, I'm based in Columbus, Ohio. So, um, you know, Hollister and, mm -hmm. um, and Abercrombie and Fitch and, and those brands were there. I knew some of the people that were in the interactive department. So, um, when they needed some music, some poppy music to accompany their footage of models pawing each other on a beach somewhere, I started, <laughs> I started doing that stuff. Hey, I'm not proud of it, but you know, it was, you gotta, you gotta do what you, uh, what you can do. And, um, that kind of gave me my start. Um, and around that time, uh, Todd was starting to do some of his early stuff too. So, um, and even before that he had used, uh, that band of mine, uh, some of those tracks on, on there. So basically from the early two thousands, um, on, um, I was doing stuff for a lot of stuff for Todd, but also for some other filmmakers, and uh, just kind of earning my stripes. Um, there's a lot to learn, yeah. and even though when you're, you know, when you're starting out, you get so frustrated because you don't, 
you know, man, I wish I had that high budget, you know, project, or man, I, ha I wish I had that gig. There's Todd Miller in the house. <laughs> um, but I am now looking back on it, I'm thankful that I had all those years uh, of obscurity to make all my mistakes, my composing mistakes, and just it, it seemed like it all kind of happened at the right speed for what I was uh, ready for right. at each point. So I, I guess you've collaborated a lot with, with the director. I was wondering if you could talk to or just talk to us about how each project was different or not necess or how that relationship was built over time more in terms of the scoring as opposed to the personal relationship. Yeah, so um, we made, uh, I think our first, first music was for Gehanna Bill, and that was my, uh, that was that band that I formed at Denison University called The Shanty. Um, those were just, you know, normal tracks, so that, that was basically like licensing, um, more than composing, but uh, after that we did a short, called The Trust, uh, and then after that we did a, a, a feature called Scaring the Fish with um, Anthony Rapp and Max Casella, and then our buddy Chance Pinnell. Um, it, was a, it was funny, I think it took, did you guys shoot that for three days? Six days, and we took almost that many years to do the <laughs> post-production. <laughs> I think it existed in like five different uh, forms over the years. So I scored it. I probably you know triple scored it. Right. Uh, but we were just we were just figuring stuff out. And it, actually, that was like a bear of a project to start with because it was three guys on the side of a lake, and there were no scene changes. So it's like to bring music in and out of that was it felt really artificial and weird. So it, if anything, it was like I started with like a you know like uh, a dive in the Olympics with like a degree of difficulty that was way beyond my skill level at the time. But uh, so we did that. Um, our first project that really um, kind of got seen and, and did things for us was uh, Dinosaur 13. Mm -hmm. And that was an opening night uh, US doc uh, at Sundance in 2014. And that got... Um, I guess there was a, some kind of a, you know, a bidding war, like what you want to happen when you get your film in there. Um, there, were, uh, there were a few different uh, players involved, but who uh, ended up with it was Lionsgate and CNN Films. And uh, so that had a kind of a, a brief theatrical run, and it, it did okay, but it really kind of found its audience when it uh, got on TV with, yeah. with CNN. And uh, that film ended up winning a 2015 Emmy for uh, science and technology, outstanding science and technology uh, programming. So um, that uh, led directly to CNN approaching us kind of for our, our next project. What are, you, what are you getting into next? And so that's when we did um, an all archival short um, about the Apollo 17 mission, which was the, the last time we went to the moon in December of uh, 1972. And uh, that, just like Apollo 11, that was all archival footage, um, which was just, it was so cool. I mean, if you get the chance to score a, a vintage space dock, like, <laughs> take the gig. It is, <laughs> it is so much fun. I've been doing it for years now, and like, I, if they, if, you know, there weren't any deadlines, I'd be happily working on it still. But um, for that film, um, for that score, I kind of used any instruments I wanted to. I just like, I w if I wanted something super modern sounding, I'd, I used it, you know, modern, there's some modern drum loops in there. So there's some, um, some really modern sounding um, reverbs. Um, like the uh, like the Eventide um, black hole, if if you guys know any of that stuff, but um, it was I love the score and I think it works with the film. But I found that rewatching it, you're seeing this 1972 footage, but you're hearing like you know 2016. Um, so it kind of it was cool. It was a cool juxtaposition, but at the same time, it gave me ideas like man, it would have been cool to like kind of match 
the sound a lot more with the uh, with the visuals. So when we got the chance to do Apollo 11 uh, for the 50th anniversary, um, that it was kind of initiated by CNN again. They were like, we got to have something for the 50th anniversary. We're, we are CNN, you know? Right. And so uh, when we got that chance, we decided to, or I decided to, um, to go full guns and just only use instruments and effects from 1969. So, um, and, that was uh, that was really cool. Um, first off, I think limiting your palette as an artist is is really a great thing because then you, you know you don't have so many choices to to paralyze you. Right. Um, but then second, you know, it, it made me kind of think of okay, what was going on in 1969? What was going on in the in the science and technology field? Obviously, Apollo was you know the tip of the spear as far as uh, technological um, advancement at the time they were they were sinking um, I've heard about three percent of our GDP which now I think wow. NASA's like 0.3 right now um, so they were they were sinking a ton of money they had 400,000 people worked on the Apollo program um, so that's that's enormous and um, that amount of money and uh, of and manpower, uh, human power, uh, has been credited with fast forwarding the kind of normal pace of technological advancement by right. like 10 to 20 years. So that got me thinking like, is there anything musical in the musical world or the music technology world that is an analog for that? Is there anything that happened then or was kind of blowing up then that then had huge ramifications on the future of music and different styles that could right. come out of that technology. And my answer was synthesizers. Yep. So, um, you know, the synthesizers that uh, Bob Moog and Don Buchla were developing and the, they started both on different coasts. So mm -hmm. Bob Moog was working out of Trumansburg, New York uh, started about 1963, 1964, working with a guy named Herb Deutsch, um, developing some of his early prototypes for the different modules that would then later become a Moog synthesizer. And then on the West Coast, um, you had Don Bukla, who um, was working with the San Francisco uh, Tate Music Center. Um, and uh, uh, he was going at it at, in a completely different way. Um, Moog was going very much more, uh, he was collaborating with musicians, trying to hear what they wanted to, yeah. to, to uh, have in their thing. He went like a keyboard approach, you know, the, his synths were very much more uh, able, to, um, able to be incorporated into like a 12-tone musical scale so you could use them along with orchestra and stuff like, like I did. Uh, Buchla was like, why would I make a new instrument to make old music? Mm. Or, you know, to recreate old music. So like when, when uh, Wendy Carlos did, uh, switched on Bach in 1968, um, it was a bunch of old, uh, it was a bunch of old um, Bach tunes set, or completely played on Moog synthesizers. And uh, a lot of people who were, you know, kind of on the avant-garde side of electronics were like, "You're, uh, that's not what we want to do. We we want to go in a different direction." Um, so you got this East Coast West Coast split between uh, the different, you know, synthesizer ideas. I tried to kind of split the difference and use a little bit of each in in Apollo, but. Basically, right around 68, 69, the synthesizer was blowing up. And if you had the ability to look into the future of what was going to happen after that, it laid the, the groundwork for all the, the cool synth stuff that was going to happen in the 70s with Tangerine Dream and Kraftwerk and Giorgio Moroder. And then, all, of course, all the 80s and 90s stuff that's like coming back super strong right now. Um, but all of that, including drum machines and all of that technology, had its its start right there. And you know, 1968, 69, it was happening. I mean, um, they had a four, they they did a, a fest or a, a concert at MoMA that 
August of 69, and they had four Moog modular synthesizers there. Mm. And uh, the modular synthesizer is like notoriously like difficult to perform with live. Right because you have to put in all the patch chords, you have to, there's a million different knobs and eventually I think we'll see we'll a clip see of me up. playing it, but um, it, they're very tough to play live, so Bob Moog actually um, developed a special preset system for those synths so that they could switch sounds quickly. Sure. Um, but they got mobbed at that concert, like it was, synths were like kind of all the rage that year, so they ended up with 5,000 people in the in the, Sculpture Garden of MoMA, if you can imagine that. Wow. I, I can't. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so it's, it seemed like the perfect thing to, to use uh, for the film. Um, plus just vintage synthesizers against vintage space footage is just like the coolest. Yeah. On an aesthetic level, they fit. They both, you know, even an old analog synth from the 60s still sounds futuristic now. Uh, even to modern ears, which is which is pretty cool. Um, so, kind of, we started working on the Apollo score very early. Um, nowadays, it's not uh, uncommon for a composer to to only have six or eight weeks to work on a on a, a film, um, or maybe you know you get maybe you get in six months early. But I was in like two two years early. Um, and I had the good fortune that Moog decided to reissue this Moog Synthesizer 3C uh, synthesizer, and they rebuilt it completely using the old uh, construction techniques. And you know, it's a fully discrete synthesizer, meaning that it has no integrated circuits, and um, it has all of the design flaws of the original too. So it's like it's murder to keep in in tune yeah. uh, when humidity changes. Um, it changes the sound. Um, it's really susceptible to interference from, you know, lights and other electronic yeah. stuff. So, um, but it was, it was cool to have those limitations to battle against. And I think um, it was totally worth it because the sound of the thing is incredible. Yeah, but absolutely. that's kind of like this. It ended up being kind of the central DNA of the, the sound of the of the film. And a lot of the cues started as improvisations. Just uh, me just going down there and being like, okay, you got an hour, let's see what you can come up with. And a lot of times those ideas, I would you know, document them all and um, a lot of them ended up being reference points. Like once I finally got the footage, um, I knew what to do with it because I, I spent like you know, a couple years down there training myself on it, almost like it, the astronauts had to train on their... Sure on their, uh, their, you know, the, their simulators and stuff, so. Okay, let's actually get into your process and how you're working. Um, I'd love to show you this clip, actually, of a ukulele sketch that you did. So we'll, we're gonna watch it. Uh, it's actually the third clip, I believe, uh, Emma, back there. Um, and feel free to talk over it okay. as well. So I think you'll be able to see it down here. Oh, cool. That was just me um, after lunch one day and um, I was procrastinating, and I didn't want to go down into the studio, and I just picked up my uke, um, which I love that thing. Um, I've, uh, I've had it since uh, my, my wife and I um, had our honeymoon in Maui, and she uh, indulged me in like two hours of me playing about every <laughs> uke in that place. <laughs> and, uh, and I picked that one. It's it's a koa top and a mahogany back and sides. It's just like it's got this just beautiful tone. It's kind of like the moog. It's you, when you find a special instrument, um, it's almost like it plays you, right. and you just pick it up and you get inspired by the sound of the thing. And you never know what it, which way it's going to take you. But a, you know, a really great instrument has songs in there for the right person, right. Um, and. Uh, so I write a lot on Uke, and um, you know Todd and I have been working together for so long that he's the only person I do this with. But I'll send him raw sketches like that. That's actually a, that's not. I mean, that is a raw work tape. Um, but I, you know, he's I've sent him stuff with like tons of mistakes and hesitations and where's that note? Actually, I think we'll probably hear something a little more raw later. But that piece. Um, 
was just a tune. I mean, we had no footage. We were way early. I don't even know um, at what point I sent that to him, but I always send him as much stuff as I can because you never know what that might inspire in him. Um, he might be able to, you know, he's always playing with, uh, with cuts. He'll have them in, you know, kind of proto stages. Um, and he might be, that might be the key to unlock the pacing of something he's working on. And so that wasn't actually used in the film, but he told me recently that he cut and pasted that um, end to end through the whole um, cut and uh, used it for pacing of, of the cuts um, visually. So it wasn't necessarily, we didn't use that tempo um, or that time signature or anything like that for any of the, the cues, but um, apparently some of those cuts line up like that if you, if you mute all the audio. Um, so I guess that's kind of like a dark side of the moon and Wizard <laughs> Oz thing. <laughs> that tune would get pretty, uh, pretty annoying after that long, but um, anyway, yeah, so I, I always try to, uh, you know, s I, I w like to get on as early as I can to a project, right. send as much stuff as I can. Um, I'll send temp ideas too, um, but I'm just always trying to get that dialogue going so that um, I can dial into what the, the specific heart of that project is gonna be, because um, then the job, Really, the the toughest part of the job is just dialing into that. The music making and stuff, super fun, and it's hard if you don't know how to do it. But um, it's that's almost like the the details at the end. Um, yeah. Right. So let's talk more like s some of these other things. Like let's talk about the translunar injection cue, and we'll watch it as well. Uh, I believe the first thing we're going to see is a beginning sketch of um, of translunar injection. Yeah, this was just a uh, me. S that was just me documenting that sound, and then I wrote down that patch, like um, how I had the filter set. And uh, yeah, it's a beautiful beast, isn't it? <laughs> it's great. I mean, we're gonna see it more actually in the next clip, which yeah. is, I believe, the pre-scoring of of translunar injection. Yeah, and if you notice on that sketch, um, I'm switching between those notes quicker than I eventually did. Um, but yeah, so th this will be uh, later in the process. Um, this film was kind of different than anything that we'd done before. Um, normally, I get the cut and it's already got temp music laid into it and we kind of work on it cr um, you know, in order um, and it's just like a segmented worm or something. Like you'd, you know, it's little by little and we build it up one by one. Um, with this one, because we had all of this like 70 millimeter footage and we were using this prototype scanner that there was one of in the world and they were still literally writing the firmware as we were accepting the, you know, getting the film from the National Archives and stuff and we were getting behind schedule and um, so I was like, okay, I know my deadline isn't changing even though I, I'm not going to get the footage as early as I thought. So I had to work ahead of time. So. In this clip, you'll, I had a head-mounted GoPro, <laughs> and this is me recording the actual final synth take of this cue. The translunar in injection is when, after they, um, after they lift off, they get into Earth orbit, and for a couple of hours, they just check out the uh, spaceship to make sure that everything's working okay. Um, and once everything, they get the, you know, the go sign from NASA, um, they do the trans uh, lunar injection burn, which is they fire the engine and they leave Earth orbit and they head out towards the moon. Um, I didn't have the Apollo 11 footage of this yet, so I used the Apollo 17 footage from uh, the last steps. So you'll hear, you know, Apollo 17, you go for the moon, because I used the temp yep. audio and stuff to just kind of psych me up. Um, but that's, you right. can roll it. One of the things that I did with this was, uh, for most of the film, thank you. For most of the film, I panned the synth hard left. Um, or actually, it started left, and, and then it moved to the right um, when we moved into the, the moon's uh, gravitational field. I didn't mean to do that, but it, I noticed it later, and uh, 
I should just act like I meant to do it. But um, anyway, I would pan the synth hard to one side, and then uh, I used this vintage uh, uh, mechanical echo called an Echoplex, or uh, a Benson Echo Rec. I also used an Echoplex EP2, but I used a uh, all-tube uh, Benson Echo Rec 2. It's a, rather than using uh, magnetic tape to generate echo, it uses a rotating uh, metal um, drum basically with magnetic strip around the edges of it and uh, I had one um, and that was panned on the complete other side so I and I would typically not to get too technical but um, I would set it to a beat division so that th things would happen first on one side and then they would be echoed on the other side and when you used a, um, a sequenced thing a, a, a sequencer like that that just basically spits out the notes in a certain order, you, you'd basically be generating these these harmonies between the, the note that's being generated right now and the note that was being echoed from a second ago. Um, so I use that trick a lot and you'll, when you listen to the score with headphones, you'll, you'll get a lot of like left to right or right to left movement uh, going on. But again, it was just like taking the taking the old tools and just tinkering around with them and seeing what I could do with them. Um, yeah, I, th I think the best way to, to say it is it's just cool shit. Like, it just it looks <laughs> awesome. <laughs> Sounds yeah. great. Um, I want to move on to the Rendezvous uh, queue, which is also really amazing. Um, I want to start again with the beginning part. I believe we've got a piano sketch uh, that you started, I guess, the, the process of. So I'd love to hear that, and maybe you can talk about it as well. Yeah, this is a different, this is a different approach. Um, I actually wrote this in one of the uh, chord progressions in 2012 when we were working on Dinosaur 13. And that's what you're going to hear here. This is me just um, playing uh, my, I got, I seem to uh, have this ability to take all instruments from my family members. <laughs> like when people get tired of their instruments, it's just give it to Matt. So I, this is my grandparents' uh, Jansen piano from the '60s, um, and it was just a work tape again, just me probably on an iPhone or something like that, um, just recording this idea. And we never used it for D13. Um, I was I had a spot to use it in the last steps, and then didn't end up using it. Um, but uh, so this is that piano sketch, and then eventually we're gonna see, we're gonna hear a, a, a guitar sketch that includes the beginning of the this cue, um, which is not on this, uh, on this piano sketch, and then you'll hear a guitar version of what you're about to hear, and then finally we're gonna see the final cue. But yeah, so we'll start with the piano. Okay. Thank you. And then I guess so. F from this, you're you're taking that idea and you're adding guitar, or you're you're performing it on guitar. Yeah. So the cue that this is used in is uh, it, I, I called it rendezvous. We also would call it l lunar liftoff sometimes, or uh, spaceship sex, because <laughs> it's when they're lifting off of the moon and they uh, they're coming up. Uh, the lunar module is coming up, and uh, the command module. They, it's actually a pretty tough process and takes, it can take a while, but they have to basically do a dance in the sky to, to kind of line up and, and get back together. If they can't get back together, you know, they're, they're in trouble, especially, well, Michael Collins would have been fine, but... Uh, <laughs> um, so anyway, um, this was actually one of the scenes that was, uh, was post-scored, meaning that I had the footage for this. Great. Um, and um, there's this beautiful unbroken shot that Michael Collins takes where the spaceship just comes out of nowhere. I mean, it's just like the tiniest little dot against the moon's surface, and you'll see it in a second, um, but uh, the spaceship just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and um, so I had a lot, of, uh, a lot of time to fill musically. Um, that's one thing that I, it's awesome working with Todd because he uh, he loves music too, and he'll make these big sections and just put it on my shoulders like you're gonna you're gonna drive the ship here, and I'm like no, <laughs> how can I do yeah? And then I you figure out how to do it like 
the night before at like three in the morning, like <laughs> when you have a deadline. It, that was a common theme on some of the earlier panels today was just how how great deadlines are because um, it's really the only way that any work ever gets done. <laughs> but um, but this was a long scene, it, you know, so it, it had to it had to be insistent and have like good movement to it. Um, but it had a lot of sections, so there's uh, there's an intro section which is a very a very spare minimal uh, melody that's just going up in a straight line. It's doom boom 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 boom, and they're again they're coming off of the moon, so I thought an ascending melody would make sense there. Um, so that's what you'll hear at the beginning of this guitar sketch. Then you'll hear like a guitar version of what I just did on piano. Um, and then um, that's enough for now, probably. Yep. We'll just roll that. This is just work tapes. Like uh, when I'm working up a cue, I'll typically, you know, it started with a little, um, in high school, it was like a little cassette recorder I got at a uh, garage sale for $2, and the, the eject button was broken. So I opened the thing up, I got my screwdriver out, opened it up, found the little tab where the eject button was supposed to attach to, and I just tied a string to it. So it was like you would eject it by pulling this literal piece of string like a like an old timey toilet, like in <laughs> The Godfather, you know, where they tape the gun. But uh <laughs> so uh, you know, as I got older, I got better and better uh, recorders and stuff. You know, dedicated, really nice recorders. But nowadays, I just use my phone. But yeah, I'll just take like little ideas, and um, I've got all my recordings ever since high school. Like I've got Todd and I's band. I've got some recordings of those, um, and I just um, I've got a smart folder on in my iTunes that just basically vacuums up any track that has my name on it, mm. um, which includes all, you know, I, I named my phone Matt Morton's That's phone. Awesome. So all the voice memos, um, when I sync up my um, my phone with iTunes, they come in, they're labeled with my name, and they get sucked into there too. So I can literally go through thousands of tracks from the last, you know, 30 years of my ideas, and that's how a, an idea from 2012 can make it into a 2019 film. Um, so I'd love to hear the, the I guess, the final cue, and then after that, we'll hopefully bring up the director, and then we can watch it within context of the film itself. Yeah, so real quick, though, um, this was, th there was a whole, like, I I'd say the cue got lengthened about 25% at the last, not the last minute, but um, after I had already kind of made it all pretty, um, and I was like, so that's the new cut now, huh? And he was like, yep. <laughs> so I had to like figure out a way to, you know, make the end of the cue make sense. Um, you'll, that big, uh, do, 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 that's w when we're cutting between the shots and they're, they're getting close and it's getting exciting. But then towards the end of the cue, um, they're making very small movements and everything has to be super precise. So it's kind of like, if you've ever been in a car and you, like you're looking, you're going to a party somewhere and you've never been there and like, so you're looking for an address number and like everybody just turns the, the radio down, like, like that's gonna help them see it better. Well, I started stripping uh, instruments and intensity out of the cue the closer and closer you get. But one of the other things that I did with my with the extra time I had to fill is I was like, you know, this is probably the more, most orchestral, um, kind of more, uh, the most acoustic or traditional instrumentation dominated cue of the whole film. But I was like, it, now that I've got this extra time, I'm going to add a synth in there. So that's that's what kind of brings it home at the end. Great. Yeah. All right. Well, listen to that. Great, that's amazing. Um, I'd love to bring up the director of Apollo 11, uh, Todd Miller, and then we can watch the in that entire cue or the entire excerpt from the film with that in context with the rest of the entire um, mix as well. Uh, please, yeah, just come up and join us. Thank you so much.
thank you. Thanks for coming. Oh, he, he's wearing his HAL t-shirt. Oh, nice. It's nice. <laughs> Great. So uh, I guess I'd love to, we'll just watch the entire excerpt of the film, um, including that cue. And by all means, you guys, of course, can talk over it. And if you want to talk about the entire mix, um, how that worked with the, you know, with the other effects and, and audio that we're hearing as well. Matt's awesome. <laughs> So um, it became more important, uh, Matt's music became more important to be the voice of the voiceless. Um, and that happened time and time again with the score. It was things that weren't in the archive. Uh, we needed to be, you know, we needed to have uh, something to complement it. Uh, so Matt's music, uh, Eric's sound design, uh, um, and Eric's a, a big, we should mention him, he's a big piece of our team. Uh, we've all worked together for so long. Um, and muxing everything together. Um, he didn't just do sound design, he also mixed the film too. Right. So, Yeah, it's kind of like Matt, uh, you know, is the music producer on the film. I mean, like he said, uh, you know, I just can't say enough about him. Uh, it's great to like be on a panel and actually talk about him because uh, I rarely get to do it but um, early on I mean we pre-scored the entire film uh, for the most part except for this cue really uh, and so like he said he'll give me thousands of tracks um, stuff I've even forgot about you know I'm like oh my god this is like from 10 years ago uh, he's like no I think it'd be good for you know this scene and we talk about it um, so and Eric's the same way you know maybe a piece that Matt will give him will get him inspired and Matt's very open to that I mean who else, who, what other music composer would sit here and show you all the fuck-ups from his ukulele, you know? And he's like one of the most incredible guitar players I know. Um, so, uh, but he's like that, you know? There's times where we'll record stuff on our iPhones and give it back and forth, particularly with like trailer ideas, you know? That's because um, we've been fortunate enough to cut our own trailers for our films. Um, and we're always doing um, maybe just like kind of a, a byproduct of uh, just continuing to be creative. Sometimes in the edit or you're doing the music, you get stuck. So, all right, well, let's just go and do something else with the same footage. Maybe let's just like work on a, a little style sample that we can give everyone or like, you know, a, a little trailer, 60 second little thing and just take like a break for a day and just do that. Um, so we do that constantly. Um, I kept sending them like these 49, the, the first cue and, uh, which is called the burdens and the hopes. And also, uh, the countdown cue both came out of this 49 minute uh, improv on the synth that I did. Uh, and I, he, he listened to all the stuff that I sent. I sent him so much stuff and he, that inspired you. Like we were, we were well, it's searching an amazing for way to music. Work. Like, it's an amazing way to work. I mean, I don't know if there's any editors here or filmmakers, but you know, your biggest gripe is you never have good music. You never have good anything. You know, you never have enough, and you're constantly using all this popular, you know, temp tracks uh, that you know you're never going to use. And then what happens? It sticks with you, and you work on it forever. And then you get married to it. And then by the time you start working with your music composer, you're nothing they're ever going to create is going to be good enough. So, with Matt um, on this project, what was really unique um, was that I was getting these like absolutely amazing pre-scores <laughs> like you know it was like every day was like you know my birthday i was getting an hour-long synth score um sometimes and you would hear stuff in them that i didn't hear when i was making it like you cued in on that part of that 49 minute thing yeah. and used it for to rough in the countdown and then i went back and right before we were going to shop it at can i took what you you roughed in and then I added all the layers and that like the kick drum on at 60 beats per minute to kind of simulate the, the countdown of the seconds and stuff. But like, it's definitely a, like a tennis rally. Yeah. Know? It's an amazing way to work. I mean, we, you know, we, I mean, we've known each other so long. We, you know, we fight like brothers, but, um, uh, at the end of the day, you know, conflict breeds creativity. But I think on this one, we didn't really even really get into it, unfortunately, because we've had some pretty good ones. I, I guess before I open it up to the to the audience for some questions, I'm wondering if the way you two work, if there is like, you know, a really specific moment, you know, if you if you tell them, you know, at 1:15, I really need something at this point, or is it more of like, here's the cut, or here's like this entire section, what do you think is interesting? It's a little bit of both. I mean, I'm a very mathematical editor, so like Matt said, uh, for at least the last 
four or five uh, films, uh, whether they're shorts or you know feature length. Um, I've always taken one of his early designs and kind of put it on, I think you said this, like a mute track. Uh, and it's usually like a ukulele or like, you know, a, a quick measure, usually in like three, four, four, four time. And you could like watch the entire film like that and every edit hits on just that measure, you know, on, on the beat. Um, and if I ever get lost in the edit, which is constantly, I always go back to that. Um, uh, and he's... So uh, you should give me your best editing awards. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> totally. That Sundance yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, jury yeah. award. Was you have to go pick it up at the National <laughs> Archives where it is. We <laughs> gave it to them. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, I, I think... Um, I'm trying to think the... Uh, the the last I I know the the you pre score pretty much all of all of the early stuff and even the sketches um, you know I already know what it's gonna sound like even when he gives me a sketch just because I know what his you know and Which then it's so amazing because usually I mean he's seen me take crappy sketches that with tons of clams in it. And turn it. You, you know that I can turn a, a uke into a string quartet, or vice versa. And right. but it's most more about the chord. You know, can't. It's more about the chord progression, and you know, and that's kind of what we argue. What well, anytime we have any like arguments, I'm like, ah, maybe instead of like that minor note here, you might just want to do like a major chord or something like that. And he knows what I like, which is pretty dark, ominous stuff most of the time. So yeah, no piccolos or uh, xylophones. <laughs> it's. I think you would be happy with just drums and like just yeah. like low end low yeah. cellos. Just like I could hire like forty cellos and like a drummer, and you'd be happy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. and also uh, when we did the launch sequence. Um, uh, I knew there was not going to be, you know, a lot of Apollo 11 is the absence of sound. Um, even going back to when we did Scaring the Fish, which ended up being about 70 minutes long, so it's not really feature length, it's not really short, it's a narrative film. And the idea was to, to have no music on that whatsoever. Um, and then we said, eh, maybe we can have something, and Matt could give us something, you know? And then you did, and you gave us like a ton of stuff, and then it was like scaling it back. Um, and that's kind of what the launch queue in Apollo 11 was like. Um, we kind of went, um, you know, above and beyond, and then just kind of peeled it back. Um, and then it was integration of sound effect and sound design, um, which gets lost in a lot of rooms uh, yeah. because there's a lot going on uh, in that we have, uh, you know, the loudest sound a, you know humans have ever come up with. Uh, you know, a Saturn V F1, you know, five F1 engines all firing um, at the same time. Uh, and then you have uh, the sound design of going through the atmosphere. What would that have s sounded like if you were next to the camera? That was kind of always what we wanted, the, you know, kind of the rules of, of the sound design. And then Matt's music was somewhere in between all of that. Uh, and it was, I can only imagine, um, you know, the difficulty that he went. I'm sure Jen, his wife who's here, can. <laughs> you have to, yeah. I mean, uh, if I had a gripe about working on vintage space footage is that y the dialogue and uh, all the static and stuff is right in those upper mid-range frequencies where all of the attack transients of notes happen. So uh, it's like an arms race, you know? Like... Um, it's super bright, so then I add super bright to it, and then it gets brighter. It's like a guitar player turning up after sound check in, in a band, you know. Yeah, and I never like mixing in like big room, like big really nice rooms with like fifteen thousand dollars speakers, because you know it's never gonna sound like that. Even our IMAX mix, um, you know, we mixed uh, that in two different rooms at IMAX, um, and I knew it was never gonna sound like that. You know, maybe in an IMAX room, but. You know, you're watching it in a theater like this, or you know, a uh, theater uh, multiplex. Um, you know, they're middle of the road JBL speakers. So let's, you know, let's try to make it sound, you know, as good as we can for that. Um, and then everything else is going to be gravy. But I always, I always benefited from uh, Todd would always include Eric's um, sound design sketches in the, in the um, the dialogue uh, track basically, that I was working with. So I would know where dialogue was going to be, uh, where it wouldn't be generally. Sometimes that changes, so then you have to move the melodies around and stuff. But I just kind of erred on the minimal side and just left room for... There was a ton of dialogue in, in the film, so a lot of I a lot of times would just kind of 
forego the melody and, and just try to make a vibe to paint behind it. Another important aspect is uh, we kind of knew the beginning, the middle, and the end of Apollo 11, whereas yeah. with Dinosaur 13, we didn't really, we were kind of building it as we went. We edited while we were working on that project. We were shooting out in the Badlands. I was giving stuff to Matt. We're editing here in New York. So it was, it was, um, it was a concept. It was kind of just laying the foundation and just building it. Um, and so he didn't really know what the end was going to be. And then when we got to the end, I'm like, we need like an eight minute, like, you know, like, <laughs> like yeah, just like giant build to the end. Um, so, uh, and with this also, just our, uh, you might be interested, like uh, everyone on the team was here in New York. So we all are in New York. Um, Matt's in his basement in Columbus, Ohio, in his studio. Um, and what we found over the years, uh, it's been great, you know, uh, just being able to send quick times. Um, he's the one person where I don't have to go to his studio, even though it's a lovely place and it's amazing. Um, I just, I'll send him, you know, uh, temp with just time code and he just goes away and does his magic and I completely 100% trust him. Like there's never, you know, I never have to go out there. We never have to sit next to each other. Um, so uh, it's a, we just jump on the phone. I mean, yeah, and, and we then have we have like hands. three hour like conversations. Yeah, well yeah, we, yeah, we don't talk for weeks and then it's like, uh, it's like a floodgate opening up, but like, well, I know what he means when he wants stabby strings, right. you know, it's like, oh, you want spiccato or staccato, you know, no stabby strings, stabby <laughs> strings, I th like psycho. Right, right. I think we have time for just a couple questions from the audience. Yes. Uh, the question was, what was, uh, what are some of the obstacles that I ran into on the, the project? One was the Moog itself because it uh, it doesn't like to behave. Um, it was it was built with all the limitations of uh, the 1968 design that it was a reissue of, uh, meaning that the, just the temperature and humidity changes would change the tuning. Um, uh, not to get too technical, but basically like when you've got that keyboard that's controlling it, it only works for about two octaves to, to be in tune. Um, so you, I, I would have to sometimes render stuff very piecemeal and then kind of Frankenstein it together uh, later. One of the obstacles that ended up being a benefit to the film was the fact that the footage took so long to get to me. Um, that pushed me out of my you know, uh, counter puncher mode and into uh, the mode of like, okay, well, I don't have footage, but if I don't start scoring now and, and getting some, some points on the, on the board now, um, I will never have enough time to do it the way that I want to in, you know, November and December before we got to get it off to Sundance. So um, it made me think more, uh, openly and without restrictions. Um, I think a lot of times, the second you see a scene with um, the temp, um, you've already probably crossed off a bunch of uh, possibilities of how you might score it later. Um, in, in some ways, temp is very helpful because, especially if you've never worked with the director, or producer, or whatever, it, it can kind of inform you of like what they're trying to go for. Um, even if they don't have the ability to talk about music um, very intelligently, but at the other end of at the under other end of things, it's like Todd and I have uh, scored stuff every which way, and I think we're both like super stoked on the way that we did this because, man, it's it's murder going up against like these great composers and and trying to like figure out, do the psychology of what did they like? What, or what are you liking on this? What are you not liking on this? Or like, how can I even like, you know, measure up to, you know, that sound? Um, so anyway, the limitation being that I didn't have footage to work with ended up being like awesome. And now I, I, um, I I'm kind of in talks with, with an agent um, to get me, you know, more work and stuff. And I was talking to him. He's, I was like, when do you usually bring your composers in on projects? And he was like, oh, I'd, I make sure that they're, they're not in until, uh, you know, picture lock so that they don't have the, the stress of, of having to, you know, do changes to their music and stuff. And I'm like, well, 
can we do this differently? Because I want to get in like way early. I want I want to do less projects, but deep dive into them because I had so much fun, um, you know, researching all of the all of the the music of the time and just uh, you know trying out a million things and. So I, I think I'm kind of finding my groove as a composer and, and realizing that it's kind of like the Jerry Maguire approach, like less clients and, you know, putting more heart into it or something um, and getting in on it as early as I can so that I can do all the weird head-mounted GoPro <laughs> shenanigans in my basement in Columbus. As I Matt, when we finished Dinosaur 13, he bought me a guitar uh, and... Um, I got him a GoPro, so I like to say I created a yeah, monster. Because I was like, man, what are you doing down there in that lab? And now you know, we have video evidence that he's a mad genius. I, I've got tons of my, like every experiment that I did on the synths that I knew wasn't going to be like a cue because it was too sci-fi or too weird or whatever, um, I just put on Instagram. So if you want to go on there, you can check out a bunch of my weird stuff uh, from the couple of years leading up. Just because we're here, I just want to take a sec. Uh, I, Matt and I, uh, just in terms of like filmmaker uh, composer relationship, uh, two people that we really admire a lot that have had such a long um, uh, career are uh, Godfrey Reggio uh, and um, uh, and Philip Glass's relationship, and going all the way back to Conan Scotzi, and recently they just did Visitors, um, and that relationship where you can have a theatrical experience. Um, turn the sound off and just have the visual speak for themselves um, or just sit in a dark room and just listen to the music um, and have an equally compelling experience. Uh, obviously, there's a lot more going on in their films and major themes of technology, and humanity, and et cetera. But I think that balance, uh, maybe on a, a little bit more of a commercial level, is kind of what Matt and I um, you know, fantasize about uh, as far as you know, the pinnacle of filmmaking um, and that our approach to it um, with respect to music and, and filmmaking. Unfortunately, I think that's all the time we have, but I just want to congratulate you guys. You guys did really well at the Critics' Choice Documentary Awards. Pretty much swept them all. You won Best Score, as I believe. Um, you won Best Editing. Best Editor and Best Film. I'm sure there's a lot more coming, so thank you so much for joining us. Congratulations on the film. Thanks. Thank you.